Hello and welcome to episode 17 of the SRA podcast. This is your host, Alex Humva, as always, back for another week. After taking a quick break, I took a break for a week, kind of an unexpected break, but, you know, just had to gather my thoughts, gather myself, do some behind the scenes work for other activities uh, besides the podcast, but uh, we're back, back on schedule. And as always, it seems, uh, returning for the episode is, of course, Faye. Hi, guys. So we will we will return to the podcast uh, the week after uh, the elections. So, you know, last week was elections week. Uh, some some stuff has happened. Uh, elections have been called. Some elections are still ongoing because Florida just can never do an election right. They're uh, back on their Again. Uh, it's always, always down to the wire in Florida. We don't know what it is, but Florida just can't seem to decide an election unless it's like two votes difference for some reason or another. So, as as some people might have heard, uh, the the election, the blue wave, the blue tsunami, the blue cataclysm. Uh, it had to be downgraded to a uh, blue splash, if you will. Uh, they, the the Democrats took the House of Representatives, uh, but lost seats in the Senate. So that was eh, win some lose some, as it were. Um, interestingly enough, even though you know the, there's now a split Congress and uh, there's still you know no way that the Democrats can actually pass any legislation that the Republicans don't want to go along with. Uh, Donald Trump, sitting president of the United States, uh, decided it was uh, too risky for having the Democrats involved in just one House of Congress and decided to go ahead and force Jeff Sessions out and replaced him with a uh, individual who is less sympathetic to the ongoing Mueller investigation, uh, of which lest any listeners forget or think I've forgotten the Russia episode still coming out. It just, you know, it, it's a work in progress and it's a story in progress. So it's, it's going to take a little while guys, uh, probably, probably by the time, you know, Trump is impeached and we get Pence as president horrifying as that would be. So, uh, I know how things went here in my home state of Kansas. We elected a Clintonite Democrat, so better than the actual fascist that was running. Um, we elected the nation's first Native American congresswoman to Congress. Um, there have only been a few Native American representatives elected to Congress at all. Um, I believe this is the first... Uh, I believe she is the first Native American who uh, was is a woman, and especially uh, so that she is also LGBTQ. Um, so, you know, just a free for for all of those uh, social justice warriors out there, I guess, and the uh, folks on the internet surely typing up as we speak about uh, how affirmative action has gone too far or something, and this is the terrifying future that we now live in, that uh, a badass MMA fighter is now in Congress. But uh, otherwise, you know, James Thompson, he lost here in Wichita and the uh, 4th Congressional District here in Kansas. That uh, Not necessarily the biggest fan of all of James Thompson's philosophies and views, but he's still a cool guy. And I've met him and talked to him and he's, he's pretty decent and he lost because he had the radical idea that maybe we should give health care to sick people. And not charge them for it, but alas, that's that's the way things go. Uh, Faye, I hear that California had a rent control measure on the ballot, and uh, that didn't go so good. No, you know, our election did not go nearly as well because uh, mostly because there was, I guess, less room for improvement. You know, it's sort of like you know, you had. What Kansas had going on was so bad that any Democrat was going to be an improvement. The issue in California is that it's basically a one-party state under the control of the Democrats, and uh, it's it's uh, the Democrats here are very well entrenched. It's uh, it's a very good um, very good political machine, and uh, yeah, we had a couple of ballot measures on there, and uh, Proposition Ten, 
which would have repealed a 1990s era law called Costa Hawkins, which prevented cities from imposing rent control on buildings made after a certain date. And um, that one really, that, it didn't pass. In fact, it got, it got walloped. It, it lost um, like 60 to 40. Uh, and uh, that one stung because I did a lot of activism. That was like my DSA chapter's main focus was Prop 10. We made a video. We did canvassing. We had a local rent ordinance that we supported. Um, our, our district um, narrowly voted in favor of Prop 10, but the uh, state as a whole came down strongly against it. Um, and a great deal of this was due to a wave of um, just a wave of attack ads against the bill, uh, against the proposition rather. Um, the it was sort of a, a weird situation. Um, I believe it was the World AIDS Foundation was actually funding the movement behind Prop Ten uh, because the director there apparently they have more than enough money, and the director of the World AIDS Foundation based in Los Angeles. You know, he thought, you know what, rent control, it's a good thing. I care about poor people. You know what, I'm going to put, I'm going to put my support behind it. I'm going to put this AIDS foundation support behind it. Here's, you know, several million dollars. Well, uh, all the uh, landlords and property owners associations and, uh, you know, basically, basically the entire landowning class of California came down against this and they put, they outspent, um, they outspent the Prop 10 campaign uh, by about three to one, very, very well-funded attack ads. And they didn't just attack the idea of rent control. They actually deliberately caused confusion about what Prop 10 even was. They had some ads that were misleadingly worded to make it seem like Prop 10 would prevent rent control. And those were targeted directly at low-income neighborhoods in major cities to cause confusion. And uh, they lied and said that the proposition would do just like random stuff like, oh, it's going to destroy our economy. It's going to raise your taxes. It's going to do this and that and the other thing. They just flooded the airwaves with so much bull crap and they outspent the Prop 10 campaign and the Prop 10 campaign didn't really have enough money to begin with. And it relied a lot on activists and, you know, it just wasn't enough to make it across the finish line. So that one stung. Uh, we also had Proposition 8, which would have restricted the profiteering of dialysis centers because a lot of those, you know, the dialysis is paid for by the federal government, and um, but they also skim money off their patients as well. And by offering, oh, it's a nicer facility, and oh, you get more nurses per, you know, per patient, and oh, you get, you know, there's a fountain in the lobby and marble and plants, and oh, doesn't it look nice? And we have this habit. They try to make it into a spa treatment and bilk people for money. Um, by not providing an alternative that's, you know, cheaper. It's sort of a rigged market. And uh, and the dialysis industry is full of abuse. It's There's a lot of elder abuse that goes on. There's a lot of bad nursing that goes on. So there was Proposition 8 was going to limit their ability to profiteer off of taxpayer money. And again, they outspent uh, the dialysis companies, dumped, I think it was $122 million um, to prevent this proposition from passing. Uh, again, just lying about what the proposition would do, spreading confusion, same, same playbook, pretty much. I think it's sort of a standard, you know, I think, I think there's a, a template that the local bourgeoisie has figured out for suppressing propositions that limit their profits. And so that one didn't pass. I wasn't as invested in that, but whatever. Um, aside from that, no real, there wasn't any real major political movement in, uh, in California, Diane Feinstein won her seat. You know, Kevin DeLeon gave gave her a run for gave her a run for her money, but you know she beat him pretty pretty handily, uh, just on name recognition. And she's very popular in the Bay Area. And Kevin DeLeon is not a perfect candidate either. He, yeah, he's progressive ish. He's he's better than Feinstein. That's about all I can say. But anyway, he lost, and then um, House elections. Um, a few Republican seats flipped down. There was one in Orange County that flipped, I believe. Um, Dana Rohrabacher, the famous, he's, he's probably come up in your uh, research for the Russia episode, you know, Putin's favorite congressman. Uh, he lost his seat, which is nice. Um, the other high profile Republican in California, Devin Nunes, uh, he managed to win re-election, but that's really just because of the way his district is drawn. Um, 
It's, it's, I, w- I don't know if I can call it gerrymandered, but it's sort of, it's a weird district that picks up suburbs of Fresno, which is like a low income kind of crappy city in the Inland Valley. Um, it's, uh, it's some of the suburbs of Fresno, and then it's a huge chunk of rural agricultural land. And a bunch of the population is undocumented immigrants who are like migrant farm workers or, you know, just undocumented farm workers. And so most of the people who vote are going to be the farmers who own land. And it's just, there aren't enough Democrats in that district to get it over 50%. It's just demographically stacked towards Republicans. But for what it's worth, um, the result this time was much narrower, was much closer than the Democrats had gotten in like a decade. So they gave it a good shot. But aside from that, nothing really exciting in California. But on the topic of national politics, um, you know, you made the comment at the beginning about how this was more of a blue splash than a blue wave. Uh, Yes and no. Um, I think that you know, the, the, the terms wave or splash or tsunami or whatever, they're all entirely subjective and are mostly a product of media narrative. Um, but I do think that the Democrats did better than a lot of people give them credit for, because a lot of these races were called late. They were called the day after um, the, you know, the news media had already set the narrative. You know, Democrats took the House and they took it by a pretty substantial margin. And, you know, uh it's you know the odds are stacked against them just because of the distribution of pop- of the population and all that crap. I'm not going to go into that. You can listen to 538 or something if that's your jam. But the Democrats did well in the House considering their limitations, and they actually did better in the Senate than I feared that they would do. They did lose a couple of seats. Um, the, the Republicans are going to consolidate their hold on the Senate, but uh, the Dem- Democrats are a lot. They did better than people think. They they kept West Virginia. They uh, picked up uh, Nevada and Arizona. Um, you know, uh, they kept Montana by a fairly narrow margin, which is important. They won both races in Minnesota. Um, the issue is that there were just um, some high-profile races. Uh, Tennessee, which they, you know, the Democrats never really had a chance. Honestly, uh, Breedston was not a very strong candidate, and um, so he lost in Tennessee. And then uh, McCaskill in Missouri lost. Uh, that race was like 52 to 40, uh, 45 or 46 percent. And then the Caskill lost, which uh, sucked uh, for the Democrats because she was, you know, they thought she really had a chance. But uh, Holly managed to kick her off the, managed to kick her out of her seat. And of course, the uh, big loss is Beto O'Rourke losing to Ted Cruz, which, you know, uh, people put a lot of stock. You know, it, it's sort of a situation where, Nobody really expects the Democrat to win in Texas. And Beto was the first time in a long time when they really felt like there's a chance. There's a sliver of a chance. And it wasn't enough. Beto lost. But the Democrats came closer to picking up Texas Senate seat than they have at any other point in history, you know, since the current political alignment. Um, And Beto, even though he didn't win, he boosted a lot of um, he boosted a lot of local races that are, you know, not, they didn't win the national race, but there were a lot of small um, house races, a lot of city council races, and a lot of judge elections where the Democrats completely wiped out the Republicans. Uh, Houston, I I think there was some 20 or 30 judges um, that were up for election, and all of them, the ones that won were Democrats. Not a single Republican judge made it uh, onto the bench. I think there was another city where it was like 19 judges. It might have been Austin or Dallas. I, I don't have that article in front of me. But again, just a clean slate of Democratic judges, uh, very progressive courts. And, uh, and, that's, and that's sort of the thing. Even, when, even in the places where the Democrats didn't win, they, they, you know, they didn't win Missouri, they didn't win Tennessee, they still did a lot better. And they still got a lot further and they got a lot more... Um, they picked up a lot more down ballot seats than anyone really expected them to, uh, except for the people who are predicting a blue tsunami. So, you know, the Democrats didn't do as well as they could have done, but overall, I think they did pretty well. Um, you know, it just sucks that they lost as much as they did. They didn't get the Senate. And obviously that Prop 10 failed here in California, which was a real personal blow. I think I put out on Twitter, um, 
night after the election that this election really felt like winning four dollars on a ten dollar scratch off. You know, technically you won, but did you really? <laughs> So aside from that, the only other race that isn't really settled yet, there's some there's some nonsense in Georgia, obviously, uh, Brian Kemp uh, rigging the vote up there. Uh, but Florida is still up in the air. Um, both the Senate and the governor and the agricultural commissioner are all, are all in the middle of recounts. Uh, they're all very close races, like you mentioned. And uh, they haven't been called yet. Um, it's looking like Nelson... Uh, might have a hard time picking it up, but Gillum maybe has a chance at the governorship. And, you know, the agricultural commissioner, hey, if, the, if they can get a Democrat in, then maybe they can slow down the destruction of the Everglades. That's something. So, you know, there's Florida is keeping everyone in suspense, and there's still hope there. So we'll see. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that, I mean, even though the Democrats were able to, you know, obtain some amount of control um unfortunately they don't seem to have had a reckoning with themselves yet and so it's one of those situations that uh, the dust has barely even settled and nancy pelosi and chuck schumer are up on stage talking about the uh free market of ideas and working with finding compromise with the republican party which um because the Republican Party is going so far right, any compromise means a center-right policy at best. Um, let us not forget that Steve King, of all people, was re-elected. Um, the man is a, an aberration to any sort of common sense of dignity, but he still has his seat nonetheless. Uh, it's... It's not a good situation for us in the, in the idea that we can't really expect too much to change. I mean, besides the fact that even if the Democrats were going to pursue some, you know, quote unquote, radical left agenda, i.e. maybe lukewarm social democracy, um, it would still be thwarted by a Republican Senate and a Republican president who would veto anything of that nature. Uh, so there's not much to be achieved there, and uh, and instead they seem to be actively enabling, uh, just just prepared to row over probably for some kind of concessions, like uh, right now uh, something you know related to the SRA is this uh, Senate bill that's come out. Let me look it up. Not the Senate bill, a House bill, House Resolution seven one one five. Uh, proposed by one Frank Pallone Jr. of New Jersey. And, you know, over at the SRA, we're looking at sending a response out about it. But uh, basically, it, it, would, it would mean the ban of do-it-yourself gun making. Um, you would not be able to purchase uh, assembly kits anymore. So, you know, the old uh, AR... 15 assembly kits um those those would not be a thing anymore that you could not assemble it and the bill is contradictory that it it bans assembly kits and then goes on to regulate how you use assembly kits so eh, not sure what that's about but uh basically basically it would become near impossible to do assembly kits anymore and if you do manage to get an assembly kit, you have to uh, you have to register it. You have to file for a serial number with an FFL. So there's it's all these stuff like this coming out, and that's the exact sort of thing that because this just takes out of assembly kits, and this doesn't take out of you know manufacturers that are putting the whole thing together. Uh, of course, the NRA. I haven't heard anything from them yet about this. Uh, it's been in Congress for a little while now, and I still haven't heard anything about it. And this is probably what we're going to see, is the Democrats are going to make some backroom deals with the Republicans and get their token legislation out of the way, and then just go along with the Republican agenda, which right now is Trump's agenda, or yeah. whoever has Trump's ear today. Banning, uh, banning parts kits is going to be a real... It's going to really suck for a lot of SRA members because there we have a lot of people who are fans of comm block equipment. You know, personally, I always try to steal. I try to steer people towards ARs, 
but I understand why people like AKs. And uh, if they ban parts kits and make it impossible to manufacture your own gun from parts, that's going to be a real, real challenge because a lot of AKs in America are built from parts kits, whether it's, you know, uh, mass produced, imported uh, kits like uh, like the Sentry Arms guns. You know, they make their own receivers, they make some of their own parts, but they also use a lot of imported Eastern Bloc parts because they're just better made than what you can get in America, at least for a reasonable cost. And uh, obviously, a lot of people build their own AKs, you know, people get those Romanian parts kits or, you know, Polish or whatever. Uh, if if that if those aren't available anymore, then AKs in particular are going to get really expensive really fast, and it's going to be very very difficult to get your hands on a good quality one. So, uh, yeah, if you're if you if you're a if you're an SRA member or a gun owning communist and you really like AKs, this is definitely a bill you should be aware of. And uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I hate to be the sort of person to say call your congressman, but. You know, uh, I don't think too many other people are specifically uh, speaking out on this. So maybe at the very least, we can get the this congressman's attention and annoy him a little bit on this subject. Uh, certainly getting a call from the Socialist Rifle Association. Uh, at the very least, I expect him to <laughs> wonder, wait, socialists with guns? <laughs> what nonsense is this? <laughs> yeah, I mean... That's that's why the SRA exists, is to advocate for political action for things like this. It's kind of, you can't do advocacy work without, you know, working in the system right now anyways. So it's it's uh, it's one of those situations that uh, the reason groups have power is because they have members that, you know, coordinate together and act together. And that's, that's definitely a thing that if... If folks are able to contact their representatives about it and make a big enough splash, I mean, you got to think how many people contact uh, their representatives at all, and then how many people do it in a coordinated fashion. And uh, it's one of those situations that when, uh, even if you don't represent, you know, a majority of somebody's constituents, if you are vocal, they're going to think about you more. So, uh, yeah, I mean... I'm sure for SRA members, we'll have a sample letter or a sample phone call script you can use, maybe. So we'll we'll see how that goes out. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a not good bill, and it's a confusing, contradictory bill. It defines assault weapon, um, so it 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 bans assault weapon kits, and it defines an assault weapon for rifles to be any semi-automatic rifle with a detachable magazine. So literally if you if you can pull the trigger multiple times and fire bullets and you can pop the magazine off, uh that's that's basically that's an assault weapon. That would basically be banning parts kits for or uh, the manufacture of anything except like a, an M1 Garand or an SKS or maybe or maybe one of those uh earlier tube fed semi-autos that basically yeah it's it's any semi-automatic rifle basically uh is restricted by that bill so that's a really nasty bill you know i guess it just comes down to um you know are are uh are republicans willing to piss off their gun owning base a little bit in exchange for some good pr with moderates it's is that an electoral exchange they're going to make because they might lose some gun owners in some deep red states, but they want to pick up those suburban, you know, white wine mom voters in purple states and in suburbs of, you know, blue cities and try to try to pick up the that sort of, you know, petty bourgeois conservative base again, now that they've lost it due to Trump's Trumpiness. So that's probably, you know, it, it really could go either way. Are they willing to make that exchange or are they going to veto this bill because, you know, they, they aren't going to restrict guns. It's not on brand for them. It could go either way. So that's definitely worth keeping an eye on. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you, if you want to, if you want to make your voice heard, um, we'll probably put together a script or uh, at the very least, we're going to send a letter advocating against this bill and uh, we'll see how it, uh, we'll see how it turns out. Definitely. Well, you know, there's, there's some more gun news to talk about as we move from the elections into current political happenings as it were uh something just a short thing to just kind of throw out there for 
fun is apparently this uh, company, I'm trying to look at this now, um, apparently it's, it's a small company, it's like 13 employees, and they, for Christmas, uh, employee appreciation, they will be buying everyone a handgun. So apparently this company has uh, provided uh, firearm safety classes to its employees, and now is just going to gift everyone a handgun for Christmas. So that's that's interesting. Are they hiring? Uh, I wonder. This is. I, I, I looked. I looked them up. Um, definitely not a company that I would want to work at. Uh, their their shtick is they sell uh, shot glasses with bullets embedded in them, which sounds like lead poisoning to me. I mean, eh, uses steel core bullet or you know, solid copper bullet. Copper is actually a. Uh, it's a it, copper is an antimicrobial, so you know that could partially sterilize your shot glass. Eh, it's it's one of those novelty gimmick items, and it's a small company, thirteen employees, deep red state, very conservative. So you know that's sort of why they're able to do this. You know, I'm I'm in favor of free guns. That's that's very much in line with my vision of how the world should work. Free guns for all. Um, uh, yeah. So. You know, it's it, that's a cute story. Uh, wish it wasn't a conservative company, but that's just the way the U.S. is right now. Pretty much. Pretty much. I do like on this article, though, that uh, it's from the New York Daily News. And in this article about, you know, a company giving away free handguns, of course, uh, the author feels the need to then list how 11 people were killed in Pittsburgh and 12 people were killed in Thousand Oaks um, as though handing out free handguns, which incidentally, this isn't just like boss shows up to work and gives you a gun. Um, they're still going to have to do background checks. I'm pretty sure oh, definitely. Um, that it's not just sort of thing. You'd show up to work and here, congratulations, have a gun. It's even like those free gun raffles that the media sometimes gets upset about. If you win a free gun in a raffle, you still got to do a background check to get it. Um, that's that's still you still have to go for an FFL for the transfer and everything. It's that's still how these things work. But but yes, it it feels um, it feels disingenuous to me that this article, you know, talking about this little admittedly odd uh, workplace happening of you know gifting handguns. Um, then feels the need to discuss, or at least mention, not so much discuss, but mention that, uh, you know, 11 people were killed in Pittsburgh, which, uh, you know, was an anti-Semitic hate crime committed by a Nazi. Um, so not really uh, applicable, maybe. And then the folks in A Thousand Oaks, the 12 people who were shot and killed in A Thousand Oaks, um, were killed by a former marine who um was not uh he was in a bad way he had ptsd and depression he he had a very bad time overseas and uh apparently he just became completely nihilistic and decided that he didn't want to be around anymore and so he thought he'd go out shooting a bunch of people yeah so this guy not gonna name not gonna give him his name doesn't deserve it uh he, um, yeah, he decided he just wanted to go out. He didn't feel like living anymore. He decided to just go out killing a bunch of people because he didn't care about human life anymore. And you know what? He was specifically a military veteran. He was overseas. This is a person who was broken by the military industrial complex. The person left as a husk of a human being who then took out his rage and dysfunction on others in a horrific and violent way. And this is a direct result of our capitalist economy and our government system. This is a direct result of the society that we have built. This is a person who was destroyed by the machines of war and carried on that destruction years after his uh, years after his experiences. So this is very much this is very much caused by the society that we live in. And you know, I tried off there. Yeah, and I feel like also worth noting here that the initial reaction around this was truly disgusting because um, the initial reports 
said that it was a Middle Eastern man yes. who was shooting it up. And uh, the moment it came out that it was not a Middle Eastern man and it was just a regular white dude, uh, it's fascinating just how quickly the media narrative switched that this went from an unforgivable act of terrorism to, oh, well, this guy was in a bad spot and, you know, he, he had PTSD and, you know, we, we shouldn't be too harsh on him. And uh, you, uh, haven't you heard about this other news story that's happening? And, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's just amazing to watch these things happen in real time that they are shameless about it. They are absolutely shameless about it, of how they twist and distort the narrative based upon what's going on. It's it's just, Absol- it's truly shameless. Absolutely. And, it's, and uh, the uh, rumor that it was a Middle Eastern man, I don't know if it was originated by them, but it was very much spread by the Daily Wire and also Breitbart. And uh, they put out the... Uh, they, I don't know. Again, I don't know if they came up with it, but they very much boosted the idea that this was a Middle Eastern man, and they kept those articles up hours and hours after, you know, indoctrinating their Nazi base. So that's it's not a good situation. Uh, you know, the media, you know, they they like to talk themselves up about oh the importance of the fourth state and oh we you know, speaking truth to power and we need journalists to reveal the truth. Yes, I I, I support journalism, but goddamn, the American American journalists are the worst. We have the just the worst lackeys and the most self-righteous, you know, pricks and dishonest op-ed writers. We we just have the worst media. And, you know, I, I support the media theoretically, but the one we have is just, they really are shameless. Uh, the way they control narrative. If you watch these stories develop in real time, you can very much see the gear shift again. You know, when this first came out, there was question after question. This is terrorism. Oh, it's Middle Eastern. Oh, what is this? What is this going to do to the political landscape? And then, oh, it's a white guy. Well, it's mental illness. And you know what? I think mental illness is the correct description in this case, only insofar as mental illness is the word that we give to the alienation and psychological destruction caused by the capitalist system um, in its extreme cases. You know, this man was suffering from PTSD. He had devolved into just pure nihilism. You know, this was not a coordinated terror attack. I don't know if I don't, there was no racial motive that was reported. Um, this, this very much was a man who just snapped the prototypical sort of mass shooter who just snaps and murders a bunch of people. But uh, again, that's the narrative that they always run with when it is a white man. And when they thought he was Middle Eastern, they were immediately leaned into the terrorism aspect of it. So it's very, they, they know the story that they want to write before they write it. And that's really the worst part of our modern media. Pretty much. Pretty much. It's, I mean, it's one of these situations that uh, people grasp at the quote-unquote solutions. And, I mean, getting back to this this little oddball little article about a company give gifting guns to its employees. Um, uh, there's a narrative to push, and the narrative, of course, in this instance, uh, even though you know they've done some kind of rehabilitation on this guy who who you know broke and whatever, and then the Pittsburgh shooter who was just an out and out anti semite. Um, the, the solution they that the media is now drawing upon and the reason they mention it in this otherwise you know news at 11 kind of story is the, to dog whistle basically and say guns are bad this is bad because guns are bad because guns shoot people and look at all these people who have been shot so guns are bad so you should be not happy about a company gifting its employees handguns and it's just striking to me because it really gets to me on this basis that the the, the it's so close to being able to see a problem but seeing the wrong problem it is so much a situation that you somebody should be able to look at this and should be able to look and see that a man went out and shot 11 people in a synagogue and should be able to say, what is the problem in our society? What is the problem in this nation? 
And people should be able to look at that and say, well, maybe the problem is somebody who has explicitly anti-Semitic views, who is being egged on by a sitting president of a first world nation of, of the, the, the categorically the most powerful nation on earth with the world's largest army, uh, the largest military on this planet, uh, a man who commands a nuclear arsenal capable of ending the world several times over, is egging these people on, who just recently said, uh, just recently warned Antifa that if they start agitating against uh, people, that they'll see even greater repression put against them, that the military and the police and quote-unquote tough ones will uh, go take them out. And the quote-unquote tough ones here are, of course, the Oath Keepers, the thing I've been railing against for the last however many episodes, ever since they came out and announced this, that, again, people, the Oath Keepers literally training their members on how to kill leftists. This is a real-world thing. And now you have the President of the United States, after the Oath Keepers and their leadership put out that little press release saying that they would be there whenever the President called to help him do whatever he wanted. Um, now it's literally here, folks. It's literally here that the President is basically giving a green light to uh, paramilitary militias going out and killing leftists. Uh, this is, it, it's, it's hardly even a dog whistle at this point. And, and we see it with people like the synagogue shooter who, you know, posted all these things on right wing social media. And uh, I believe was quoted as saying, I can't take it anymore. I have to do something uh, or something to that extent that, uh, he he felt compelled by this culture and this the, this permeating paranoia that the far right and these fascist movements have instituted that if you if you've really steeped yourself in that ideology and you genuinely believe that there is some uh, illuminati new world order out there being run by the jews and uh, that they're planning on committing evil acts and that uh, here's George Soros funding this migrant caravan full of supposed criminals and whatever, uh, then of course you're going to snap and you're going to do something. And, and this is exactly what this guy went and did, that he was so caught up in this and he so genuinely believed it that he went out and murdered a bunch of people uh, in a synagogue, in a religious setting. And of course the president's answer to this was well they should have been armed which by the way let's let's put put another uh wrinkle into this whole conversation so let's put something else into this all that uh, that jamel robeson uh was a security guard he was an armed security guard and he was a security guard for a nightclub and you know the, this the, a scuffle happened in the nightclub and uh uh, he, he he took care of it. He apprehended uh, the aggressor, and he was he was doing his job, and he did his job very well. And the police showed up, and they shot him dead. And uh, what's the NRA's response to this? Nothing. Uh, that here's a good guy with a gun stopping a bad guy with a gun, and he's dead now. And. Uh, now the uh, Illinois police are saying that the, the that the he didn't drop his gun when he was told to, which is contradictory to what uh, witnesses were saying apparently. So uh, it's and it's the sort of thing that as a trained security guard, like this is Illinois, the, not just everyone can become a security guard. I mean, even here in Kansas, not just everyone can become a security guard. You still have to take classes and training and get a license and everything. And I'm sure in Illinois, uh, way more, way more involved. I'm sure. Um, if 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 you're a trained security guard, I'm pretty sure that you're going to comply with a police request to drop your gun. That that's that's part interacting with law enforcement is part of the training. And so that makes me kind of suspicious that the police are coming out and saying, well, he didn't drop his gun, so the officer just shot him. 
uh, I, I kind of feel like uh, these, these, uh, these pieces of evidence are not adding up and that there's something wrong here. And most likely, I mean, this is the problem that you don't even have to stretch for this because we see it all the time here in America that he's a black man with a gun. And so the police just see that and that's all they see. And that's all they see in that moment of a snap reaction. And it doesn't matter that he was the good guy with the gun. It doesn't matter at all. And the NRA is not going to say anything about it because it doesn't fit their narrative. Um, it's, it's just ridiculous. And, and, if, but of course, you know, synagogue shooting, all Trump has to say is, well, maybe they, sh they should have had guns of their own. And it's like, well, here's an instance where somebody did have a gun of their own. And what good did it do? Um, they did their job. They stopped a fight. They apprehended this aggressor and they're dead for it. And that's, that's, that's the problem with this is it doesn't have to be consistent. Fascism doesn't care if it's consistent. Fascism thrives on inconsistency. Inconsistency empowers fascism. Not knowing what's going to happen next. Not knowing what's going to be said next. Not knowing if you can argue against your opponent correctly because they might just change their views all of a sudden. Or they might just change what they're saying all of a sudden. Uh, that's, that is the chaotic system that fascism thrives on when people are uncertain and cannot be certain of anything. Exactly. Uh, it's like Jean-Paul Sartre said, you know, fascists don't use words responsibly. They don't have to. Being dishonest is what they do. Here, they, Here's the quote from Jean-Paul Sartre. Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge. But they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. The anti-Semites have the right to play. They even like to play with discourse, for, by giving ridiculous reasons, they discredit the seriousness of their interlocutors. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. That is the fascist approach towards truth. That is the fascist approach towards argument and debate. They do not argue in good faith. And it is shocking how spot on Sartre's description of anti-Semites in the 40s and 50s was compared to, um, compared to our modern experience with the alt-right and fascists. They delight in using words in bad faith. They delight in making bad arguments and in making the people arguing with them seem ridiculous and that's their entire modus operandi and it has not changed in decades pretty much and and that's 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 the situation we are in we the the liberal response is the free market of ideas that good ideas will succeed and bad ideas will fail and much like capitalism where capitalism is supposed to be the free exchange of goods, um, this only works in a perfect, idealized, rational system. Uh, capitalism, you know, could work really good if everyone was a rational, uh, moral actor. Mm, debatably. <laughs> debatably. Uh, it's, it's the same thing of saying, though, that monarchy would be great if you had a good monarch. That, you know, if you just, if you had a rational, moral, upright person and you just gave them all the power, then they could manage things and they, the world would be so much better if, you know, just, just a perfect person had all this power and uh, fantastic, but that doesn't exist. That is an idealized system and it doesn't work. The free market of ideas does not work when dealing with an ideology that delights in misinformation and just just straight up falsehoods that they will speak the exact opposite of what is going on and there's no way to deal with it because these people will will deny the truth in front of them i mean even trump's gone out and said don't believe what you see i mean you can get can't get much more than that i mean People will say, well, he's saying, don't believe what you see on the news. 
that uh, he's not actually saying don't say don't don't believe what you see in front of your eyes. He's just saying don't believe what you see on the news. And you know, well, you could just say don't believe what you see on the news instead of don't believe what you see. Uh, the the clarification would be great, and it's only two more words, um, three more words. So, uh, but but this is the problem that reality does not matter to these people. Uh, reality does not matter to a fascist. It's just reality is no inconvenience to fascists because they shape reality to be whatever they want it to be. And if you disagree with them, then they will violently put down that disagreement. Uh, and so you can't you can't debate them. Because debate is worthless. You might as well be debating a cult member at that point. Um, you, you really have to start treating it like a cult uh, in the way of just how indoctrinated people can become in this by consistently having their own perception of the facts and reality distorted by just repeating things over and over again. And that's how these things happen is you just keep repeating it. I mean, Hitler himself said this, that you just have to keep repeating things. And eventually, people just start to believe it, because they've just heard it a bunch. And the more people that believe it, mean the more people that repeat it, which means the more people that believe it. It's it's an infectious mind virus, basically. Uh, you, can, you can really start to do these things on a really crazy level if you can get a loud enough public position and social media provides a perfect opportunity and the internet provides a magnificent platform for these folks to be able to push out their vile ideas and these falsehoods and anyone who contradicts it uh, well it doesn't matter what reality is it's obviously your group is right and so uh, you just shun the anyone who denies it. That's how that goes. Ah, <sighs> well, lest we get too bogged down in all this Nazi nonsense, uh, I will I will conclude this little segment that has taken a few different twists and turns with a thing that uh, in the good old state of New Jersey, uh, where. Uh, supposedly you can't pump your own gas. I, I, the governor has signed a new gun control bill. So, you know, even as the Congress folk from New Jersey, uh, seek more gun control at, in Congress, um, New Jersey, the New Jersey legislature and the New Jersey governor have passed some gun control bills related to 3D printed firearms. Uh, worth noting that the manufacture of firearms in New Jersey is already heavily restricted, and your ability to um, assemble firearms in New Jersey without a serial number is non-existent. Um, if you do assemble a firearm, you have to get it serialized, um, and I believe there are quite a few restrictions on actually, you know, making build kits uh, of different uh, weapons. So that that's already a heavily regulated thing there in New Jersey, as well as firearms in general. And the, but they felt the need to specifically go after 3D printed firearms and uh, have passed a bill that prohibits the sale of materials to produce quote unquote ghost guns. So basically it criminalizes anything that uh, would be used in conjunction with or with the intended purpose of creating a 3D printed firearm, um, or any firearm that is not serialized, which again was already illegal in the state of New Jersey. So it's kind of a redundant law, but it's one of those token measures that they can pass and then go to their constituents and say, look at all this work we did. We've, we've really, we've really foiled those criminals that they, they can't print their dangerous 3D printed guns that blow up after the second time you put a bullet through them. That's such a menace to society right there. Um, and it's not like they could just, you know, go next door to another state that has less gun control regulations and pick up a firearm there that we have no knowledge of. But, yeah. 
Yeah, and New Jersey is such a restrictive state for gun owners that it's almost, I mean, it's not as bad as New York City, but it's almost as bad as New York City, and it's an entire state. So New Jersey, these new gun laws are, you know, ridiculous, mostly pointless, but even then, I don't think that they're really that big of a change of the status quo for the uh, for the gun owners of New Jersey. The situation was already dire. Now it's slightly more dire. It's hard to make a change in a state like that. Pretty much. So it's it's one of those things that uh, I don't know. It's it's always confusing to me that as somebody who has basically never lived in a very restrictive state. I mean, I, I was in Washington State for part of my childhood, but otherwise, I've I've been in the Great Plains ever since, and uh obviously we have pretty good situations down here it's it's one of those things that i i honestly sometimes do have trouble comprehending how people actually live in states that have this that I, it's just one of those things i don't even think about that you can just go down to the store and pick up an ar15 no problem and yeah a lot in, more honestly here in california it's a bit more complicated than that. Not as bad as New Jersey. A lot of people think California has the worst gun laws. We're not quite that bad. But uh, yeah, I am. Um, you know, I re- I really believe in the AR-15 as a platform, and I believe that it is a very good home defense weapon because of the tendency for five, five, six millimeter bullets to tumble and fragment while passing through drywall, which means that they're much less likely to cause serious collateral damage if you shoot someone in your home. So I'm a big proponent of the AR-15 for that purpose, but getting an AR-15 in California, um, it's classified as an assault weapon. There's additional paperwork that you have to go through. The new restrictions on ammunition are ridiculous and make some of the really good 5.56 frangible ammo no longer legal in California. There's, you know, you have to have a, a fixed magazine, which completely changes the dynamics of the air 15 platform you might have to there's there's complicated there's um assault weapon variations of the air 15 non-assault weapon variations of the air 15 and the whole thing is a confusing mess and it's just such a such a morass of nonsensical gun laws that i don't i don't want to deal with it there are some people who who do and more power to them but i said screw it i'm just gonna get a pump action shotgun and uh because that's a long arm and regular long arms, rifles and shotguns that aren't too scary in California are thankfully still fairly, fairly reasonable to buy and own. But man, once you get into semi-automatics, California really starts clamping down and the laws get really ridiculous. So yeah, I'm I'm restricted in the guns that I can't own. Uh, But I got my shotgun. I have my M1 Garand. You know, and I'm in a I'm in a county now where it's possible to get a concealed carry permit, so that's something that I'm going to be pursuing uh, soonish. That's uh, you know uh, I I think I've talked before about Los Angeles and the concealed carry permit system in this in that county and the uh, the sheriff and their corruption. If I haven't talked to them before, I, I will at a, I will at a future date. This is maybe not the right time to bring it up, but. Los Angeles, it's basically impossible for the average person to get a concealed carry permit just because the sheriff has all the discretion in that. And the Los Angeles sheriff does not give a shit about the working class. Well, as as we transition to the final story of the night, we shall take a quick interlude for me to be able to plug the ongoing, uh, ever, ever delightful Patreon account that makes this podcast possible, that uh, as as you all are probably aware at this point, but we did get quite a few new listeners from the New York Times, so if you are a new listener, uh, welcome. Thank you for listening. I hope we haven't disappointed you thus far. Uh, we have a Patreon account for this show that I do not receive compensation for this. I, I do this as a member of the organization. Uh, regardless of my leadership status within it, I, this is not run by the organization, nor does the organization tell me what to say on this. This is, this is me as a member doing something for the community. And as such, I don't receive compensation for this, except, of course, through the Patreon, which is supported by listeners such as yourself. 
that if you are listening to this and you think, man, this is this is pretty decent, I, I feel like I could chip in some coffee money or something to this this individual. Um, uh, I have the Patreon at patreon.com slash socialist RA podcast. Um, I started out at $5 a month for Patreon tiers, and this gets you access to some exclusive content. Uh, I'll readily admit I have not been putting out as much exclusive content as I would like. I've been really slumped these past couple weeks of just all sorts of stuff in my personal life and uh, stuff with the SRA and my involvement with them there. So it's, it's, it's unfortunately fallen by the wayside somewhat, but I do intend to start putting out much more regular exclusive content, not only, you know, special episodes and things of that nature, but also just, I need to get back into essay writing and such. And that's a really good place for me to be able to put out uh, content, just some short form essays to be able to entertain folks who do give just a couple bucks a month to, you know, help this keep going. And it's not a huge amount, but it, it definitely makes a difference when that check comes in at the first of the month. And it's, it's, it's nice. So if you want to contribute again, it's patreon.com slash social story podcast, and you can, you can go and sign up and feel good about buying somebody five boxes of spaghetti. So it, it, I can make those last quite a while. Speaking of five boxes of spaghetti though, um, Amazon, the world's number one provider of stuff that gets shipped to your door in two days. Um, magically, honestly, I'm not sure how they do it. I, having been in the logistics industry, uh, I could barely get somebody to, uh, deliver one flat from one side of the warehouse to the other side of the warehouse in two days, nor or less get anything from anywhere in the nation to anywhere else in the nation in two days. But it, Amazon's figured it out somewhere via black magic or some other means, and, and they have become an extremely profitable company for this, shipping all manners of items from boxes of spaghetti to, I don't know, 55-gallon drums of lube. So, uh, they, they are very profitable. They make a huge amount of money. Jeff Bezos, their uh, CEO, is the world's richest man. He is filthy rich. He makes thousands of dollars every second just by the sheer compound interest on his uh, investments and his stock options and his just sheer monetary wealth. Uh, the man is very rich and he is spending his money to uh, escape this planet. So that tells you what he thinks of our future prospects. Uh, because they're such a huge company, they've needed a new secondary HQ from the one they've got up in Washington. So they've been going around the country for the last couple of years uh, causing bidding wars, making uh, cities uh, do their bidding. Uh, I believe it was Chicago that was suggesting taxing uh, workers, putting a special tax on workers uh, working at Amazon to pay back to Amazon. So literally imposing taxes on Amazon workers to pay back to Amazon in form of uh, government kickbacks. So... Just, just some real crazy feudal type stuff right there. But uh, after, you know, years of letting all these companies or all these cities on and causing general havoc in these uh, markets, of course, they've selected the natural thing that they're going to go to New York State and Virginia. Uh, this is this is where they've settled on because it's the political capital and the economic capital of the nation and in some ways the world. So, yeah, of course, they're going to put their headquarters there. But shock and surprise to no one. Um, worth noting in this that they are going to receive an estimated two billion dollars in government benefits for doing this, that uh, New York State is going to provide one point five billion dollars in government benefits to uh, a in uh, a variety of different things. So, you know, direct grant programs, uh, tax cutbacks or uh, tax forgiveness or whatever. Uh, uh, so I'm forget blanking on the word for what I'm looking for, but uh, all as well as just general government programs. Some people suggested instead of giving all these billions of dollars to Amazon, maybe we could spend that money on something like student loan forgiveness or improving medical care for New Yorkers. 
rather than, you know, just shoveling this at a giant corporation. Pretty much. I mean, if you think about student loans, I mean, unfortunately, $1.5 billion would be a mere fraction of the student loan debt that Americans have nowadays. And it's a real sad situation that we're in that situation, but it would still make a difference. You could still pay off folks' loans with that. You could pay off quite a few folks' loans with that. Um, you could definitely make a dent on quite a few. So, yeah, that, that's definitely better ways to do that. You could also uh, spend it on some health care. Maybe, you know, buy people insulin. Who knows? It, it, there's, there's definitely ways that that could be probably better spent. Because, of course, uh, everyone's saying, well, this is going to bring 50,000 high-paying jobs. And, um, well, let's let's be clear about this. A lot of those jobs are going to come from existing jobs in Amazon. Amazon is just going to redistribute people. And yeah, they're going to make some new hires and they're going to add on some jobs. And then they're probably going to go lay off a bunch of people as they continue to automate their warehouses more and more. Um, it's worth noting that uh, on the whole, uh, America has been losing high-skilled jobs that ever since those corporate tax breaks that the Republican Congress passed that was supposed to just be a shot of adrenaline to America's beating economic heart, um, and people, the, the companies that have benefited the most have been laying off jobs left and right. Uh, these companies aren't doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, they are collecting this money specifically with the intent to distribute it to their executives and their shareholders. That's that's how this works. Make no mistake. There's the any economic benefit you see of these of the Amazon coming into an area and uh, employing people uh, for whatever people actually are employed from the local area. Um, I guarantee there will be a dozen low paying workers or more that are laid off to offset that rather than actually, you know, making a contribution to the economy by adding more jobs. This is just this is just how it goes nowadays. Uh, anything that cuts into the profit margin just can't be can't be handled. Another uh, aspect of this story that I think a lot of people didn't pick up on is that during its HQ2 selection process, Amazon went all over the country and got, you know, submitted requests for information to all these different cities asking all sorts of information about their infrastructure, about their workforce statistics, about, um, you know, what sort of incentives they're able to offer, how their permit process works, how they're, you know, how they handle, um, how they handle a new business coming to the community. And what Amazon did by getting all these bits, it's, it's a near certainty that Amazon already had probably like five cities in mind when it started its search for HQ2, and it wasn't really seriously considering most of the other ones who applied. But um, by putting, by gathering all this information, by putting out all these RFIs and getting responses, they've collected a vast trove of municipal data on how all sorts of different local city governments all over the country work. And more importantly, they know about the labor forces in those cities and what sort of uh, talent they can expect if they open up a new, I say talent, what sort of new labor they can, uh, you know, take advantage of in these cities, what skills are available to them. Um, and also they know what the city government is willing to give them. And they're able to say, hey, we want to open a new warehouse here. And you said that you'd give us X amount of dollars, you know, if we opened up, if we gave you a bunch of jobs here. And the city government might say, well, yeah, but, you know, that was for HQ2. Oh, well, I guess we'll just have to open this warehouse in another city unless you, you know, unless you want to give us that, uh, unless you want to give us that uh, benefit, that subsidy. So, you know, it, give, it gives Amazon a lot of power. They're a data-driven company, and they've just collected a huge trope of data over the last year. And that's really probably going to benefit them financially to the cost of average workers who are paying these taxes that are subsidizing Amazon and the, and Jeff Bezos, the richest man alive. Uh, yeah, they're really going to, they're going to make out like bandits with all this data they've collected. And no one really considered it at the time, but in hindsight, it, it was a big data grab. 
Yeah, that's that's definitely an interesting angle on it that I hadn't really considered as much, but it is true that it's sometimes very difficult to compile all of this data for, you know, just how governments work. That it seems like a silly thing that you wouldn't even know how your own government works, but I mean, uh, this is a real problem at the local level that I'll admit that I don't even always know how uh, the city government works. The city government has many different layers inside of it with many different uh, offices. And uh, we have, you know, the mayor, but we also have a city manager and we have a uh, like a city coordinator and you, a bunch of different like executive level uh, positions that all seemingly do same but different jobs. And knowing how those exact delegations of duties work is very inf useful information, especially for a major business like this. And uh, what I suspect might happen is that Amazon's going to compile all this information together and then sell it as a package, a service package to small businesses that are looking to expand, or maybe not small businesses, but intermediate sized businesses that are looking to expand outside of their local location and go to a new location, but can't necessarily afford to, you know, pay people to research all of the local laws and how the city government works and who you need to talk to in city government to get things done. Uh, it's it's a very, it, it could really be a very interesting system if they compile that information together. Of course, they're going to charge an arm and a leg for it, no doubt, and you're going to be surrendering whatever information you have to Amazon in the process. And, you so, know, if Amazon wasn't already planning to do this, then certainly now that you've said it, they're going to scrape the data from this podcast and pick up the idea from that, and it's going to make its way up to Jeff Bezos, and that's going to be their next venture project, <laughs> is uh, putting all that data to good use. <laughs> so, if, if that's how this works, then, um, you know, would it be just the best for Amazon and the best for capitalism in general and just like the prosperity of businesses and executives and shareholders everywhere is if we received a very generous contribution to the SRA that picture it this way that you know when people see all these socialists they'll think man capitalism is so great we have to support capitalism, and you'll see a massive influx of support. So definitely uh, contribute to us so that you can be an accelerationalist for capitalism is my, my takeaway. Please, please send this to Jeff Bezos, robot. Please, please. So anyways, Amazon is just, it's, I don't know, it's a weird situation. It's it's a weird situation, and of course it's ended in a predictable way, and of course New York is as corporatist as ever and this is why i just i absolutely hate it when people are like well vote for the democrats you'll you'll get so much better when governor kumeo a democrat a pretty pretty staunch democrat uh is overriding a bunch of uh bureaucracy put into place so that uh, companies can't just come in and do whatever they want. He's using the Empire State uh, Development Program to override a bunch of these permitting processes and stuff so that uh, Amazon can build their buildings even cheaper and with less oversight and probably using scab workers because they're... It's, it's a lot of these construction trade unions are dying out and scabs in the or construction industry are just more and more common and unfortunately I, I bet you that if uh, these permitting requirements are waived and all these these development programs that are meant for businesses that you know can't afford to could to handle all this bureaucracy but these bureaucracies are set up specifically for these large businesses that do have the ability to handle it um, I bet you that Amazon's going to be looking for the cheapest labor pot that they can get away with. So you'll have a bunch of scab construction workers too, no doubt. And yeah, let's, let's not forget that Amazon workers are continuing to try to unionize and are facing severe repression about that. Uh, Whole Foods continues to repress union efforts. Uh, the Teamsters, the Machinists, the IWW, a bunch of unions have looked into trying to unionize Amazon workers and uh, Amazon is not having any of that. So 
I, I think Amazon workers in Europe are in a bit better of a situation that there's several unions in Europe that represent a- Amazon workers, but here in the States, no such luck. I mean, the, te- the Teamsters Union is out there doing stuff, but they recently approved a pretty mm, not great contract uh, for UPS drivers. So, you know, the teams, the Teamsters have been around. The, the Teamsters have been around forever, and you know, they, I'm sure things would be worse without them. But boy, they're 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 really one of those unions that gives unions a bad name. Yeah, I will say that it definitely varies from local to local. That like Hofna and these big national contracts, like with UPS, uh, you get a lot of the union corruption in there. And Teamsters especially are notorious for this. But at the same time, at the local level. I mean, when I was working at a place with Teamsters, uh, they, they had a pretty decent contract and that was negotiated at the local level for the Wichita Teamsters. And it, it was, it was pretty decent what they got. They, I believe they, uh, capped out at 32 bucks an hour and had really yeah. good benefits. That's not bad at all. So, yeah. I mean, for Wichita, that's, that's, that's making it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I guess I only really hear about the Teamsters with regards to the national uh sort of issues and with the ups contract and such so maybe i'm just getting a you know specific slice of them i don't i don't want to i don't want to talk crap on a union that does good work but you know just what just what i hear about uh, with the ups contracts it's 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 a mess (laughs) absolutely and i think that's something just at the national level in general that uh, these national level unions can sometimes get ahead of themselves and that's it's it's a real hard balance to strike uh you know the some issues you need to handle at the national level and that was something that uh, i always felt that the iron workers did good and bad was that uh, a lot of the benefits were handled at a district level so there would be a like the rocky mountain district which kansas is part of um, handled uh, pension and health benefits and such and then uh, different districts that have that, but other unions do it at the national level that they have national benefit programs. And that, that really helps for job mobility that you can go to a different union job and different place and still keep all your benefits. And that's really helpful. So things like that, national level union structures are good at. But then you get into things exactly like this with, with Hofna, Teamster president and these national level contracts that are just it's good for consistency but you introduce a whole lot of corruption when you start negotiating these huge deals at the national level that you really got to bring it a little closer to home where people care a little bit more it, it's it's hard to get motivated for things that are so big and beyond uh, individual scope that you really need to have a situation where you can sit down with your business rep and your steward and be able to talk about the contract and see what benefits you and what doesn't benefit you. And on a national contract, it's, it's, it's really difficult to do that. Well, we will conclude the night after this little Amazon segment with a quick uh, thing on a story I just found. And, you know, kind of tying into that theme of laying workers off and the impending doom of automation under capitalism. Uh, I'm reading an Ars Technica article right now that says Walmart agrees to work with Ford on self-driving grocery delivery pilot. So they are doing this in Miami, apparently, and they will be testing self-driving cars to deliver groceries. And you see, ordinarily, this would be fantastic. Because it's like, great, I can uh, push some buttons on my phone and my groceries show up to my door and a robot delivers them to me. And isn't that just the coolest, most science fiction-y thing ever? Unfortunately, um, instead of being the coolest, most science fiction-y thing ever, it means that more people are going to be out of a job because eventually it's going to get to the point where Walmart realizes that, you know, they can... uh, have a automated assembly line like Amazon does for most of their package delivery where uh, items come off the shelf and get sorted into bins, which can then be loaded into vehicles. Um, and this, this could be a very dystopic uh, thing when 
you know, you can't even find a minimum wage job at Walmart anymore because a machine has replaced it. And somewhere, somehow, there's an anarchist capitalist telling me that this is actually a good thing because this is the free market doing its thing. Uh, presumably as they type it from their parents' basement as their parents provide them an income, but eh, that's neither here nor there. You know, this sort of harkens back to, um, you hear the word Luddite thrown around sometimes um, as an insult towards people who oppose new technology for fear of it displacing people's jobs. The Luddites were an actual uh, group. They were an actually sort of pre-socialist reaction to the uh, rise of industrial capitalism in the uh, early 19th century. Um, they, and they actually, there was a series of revolts in England uh, between 1811 and 1816. And the Luddites, um, they, were, they were artisans who, you know, produced goods in small quantities, craft style in their homes. And they had guilds that regulated the production and the sale of their merchandise. And this was an economic system that was part of the, uh, you know, the advanced stage of the feudal system. And it, it was a system that had been around for generations. And this was displaced by the arrival of the bourgeoisie and the beginning of industrialism as wealthy landowners began creating factories to produce mainly um, textile products in large quantities. And uh Obviously, this, uh, you know, created a lot of supply, drove down prices, standard, you know, economics 101. Um, so a simple, even an ANCAP can understand it. And uh, the Luddites reacted against this by um, straight up going out and burning down factories because these factories were a direct threat to their economic well-being. People were, you know, going hungry. They were losing their homes. They were, uh, you know, in really dire economic straits because they're... Um, position had been disrupted by the introduction of, you know, organized mass, mass production. And so, you know, the Luddites, the sort of common liberal right-wing take on the Luddites is, oh, they were, you know, they held back progress and they were just selfish and, um, you know, their, their, their suffering um, was just a cost of the uh, advance of civilization and the development of capitalism. And it was totally justified and, you know, oh, they were so unreasonable for burning down those factories that were essentially driving them out of business. You know, I, I, I sort of sympathize a lot with the Luddites here, because when you get down to it, the introduction of a new technology that reduces the labor needed to create a product should be a good thing. It should be something that improves the lives of millions of people, and it should free up human labor activity to allow people to engage in leisure, in research, in learning, in developing and living as human beings. You know, this is, that's sort of, that's what Karl Marx talked about. That's, that's whole chapters of capital right there, boiled down to this concept of, you know, the, the industrial processes that we develop should be used to liberate people, not to drive them into poverty. But it is the nature of the capitalist system. It is the nature of the economic system that we've that we live under, that when a new technology is introduced, when a new, you know, whether that be a machine or an organizational strategy, when it's introduced, it um, it displaces people. If it if it makes their if it makes their labor less valuable, it leads to people um, being unemployed. It creates poverty. This um, this is not this does not have to be the way. It ha- Excuse me. This does not have to be the way it works. And uh, yeah, and, and, you know, so the Luddites get a bad rap for holding back progress, but when it comes down to it, they're reacting against one of the main evil side effects of capitalism, and that is a side effect that is affecting us today as the introduction of more and more advanced automation and the automation of white-collar jobs as well, and the destruction of the lower ranks of the petty bourgeoisie and the middle class. You know, I think that people should maybe study up on the Luddites and see what they were about. I'm not I'm not going to advocate burning down factories, but maybe those factories should be run by the people who work there rather than by some uh, shareholder who's never even set foot in the place. You know, that's that's sort of what we're about, right? <laughs> yeah. And I feel like for folks who, you know, they, they feel like, well, automation can never come to my job. Uh, I have this nice white collar professional job 
Uh, unfortunately, folks, those are the first jobs they're coming after. I mean, yeah, you, there's there's the old assembly line, and everyone thinks of the uh, United Automobile Workers, and you know how the all these car manufacturers went to automation to avoid union costs. Um, well, yeah, that's how it was back then, definitely. Um, now, though, it's one of those things that... Um, a lot of blue car work, quote unquote, uh, you can automate it, but it's a lot more difficult. I mean, uh, when I was doing iron work, um, it's really hard to automate iron work. It's it's hard to get a robot to scale iron and put beams together. It's uh, we're not quite there yet. But guess what? We can do. We can make robots program other robots. We've got robots to make computer code now. We've got robots to do accounting work. We've got robots to diagnose you with illnesses. We've got robots uh, that do legal research to look up laws and uh, case law. Um, and that's causing a huge issue because it's eliminating all the entry-level jobs in the in the legal market. And uh, lawyers can't uh, get off their feet anymore. You know, they can't get onto their feet anymore because these entry-level paralegal, you know, legal research uh, positions are being eliminated by software. And I mean, the job that I work at, <laughs> you know, give me a year and two programmers and I can automate my entire, uh, my entire profession away. It's not secure at all. And I'm, I'm planning to get out of that business as soon as possible. Uh, so much of this white collar work is easily uh, doable by a computer. AI is getting to the point, you know, algorithms are getting to the point where we don't really need people anymore for these sorts of work for this sort of work and i think that it's going to affect a lot more people a lot sooner than people realize definitely yeah automation is is one of those things that i could have automated my job as a team lead in the warehouse and i almost did i mean i was getting to the point where i was doing enough repetitive work that i was trying to write a c plus plus program to just be able to load all of my work in and get it done. And that would have been great because I could have just sat around doing nothing all day at work. But unfortunately, I just didn't get the chance to complete that before moving on. So, yeah, it's it's one of those things we've got to keep an eye on. And hopefully, hopefully we don't get too dystopian before things finish up. Well, on that note, we will go ahead and call it a night and put this episode to rest so as always i can be found at humvadev on twitter faye can be found at la underscore socialist ra uh on twitter as well and uh any questions comments concerns and suggestions for the podcast can uh be forwarded to me on twitter or if you're a member you can post on the kind of recently created uh, hashtag uh, podcast on the member only Slack. I, I'm always checking that as well. Um, as well as, you know, subreddit basically anywhere that the SRA is around. I, I will be around to monitor that to see any feedback. You can also leave reviews on iTunes now, apparently. I have 15 reviews, which I'm glad about because that that bumps me up in the itunes ratings so i will bid you all a good night good night everybody aren't you gonna say seize the means of production i can but at the same time i I feel like well i got that catchphrase in the beginning now i don't know i just haven't been feeling it yeah seize the means of sleep is what i'm (laughs) gonna say yeah i'm pretty tired too So, good night, everyone.